running a food security task force in your community. Um, this program is bought, brought to you by the Rural Cap Grow program in cooperation with our partners at the Cooperative Extension. Thanks, Gina, for always helping us. Um, I'm really excited today to um, we have some great um, guest speakers that are going to um, be telling us about you know, their background and what they're doing to help their communities. And we'd really love to have a conversation with you. So we're hoping that um, you'll also be able to talk about what's happening in your community and we can just talk and ask questions. It's a nice size group for that. So um, before I do that, I'm gonna turn it over to, oh, I didn't say my name. I'm Emily Becker. I'm with the Rural Cap Grow program. Um, my colleague Sinead is in Fairbanks and they are going to tell you a little bit about Grow. Go ahead, Sinead. Okay. Um, so Grow is a new program that's part of Rural Cap. Um, Rural Cap stands for Rural Alaska Community Action Program. And it was founded in 1965. It's a statewide nonprofit um, working to improve the quality of life for low income Alaskans um, uh, through advocacy, education, affordable housing, and direct services. The GROW program, um, which is led by myself, Emily, and Iva, um, was made possible through funding provided by a community service block grant that was awarded to Rural Cap through the CARES Act um, back in December. Um, and we had a committee review, we got 25 applications and we were able to fund nine of those projects. Um, recently, we were able to just fund one more with some extra money that we had. So we're currently funding 10 projects. Um, the CARES Act funding ends in September though. So we've been working closely with community partners to establish relationships and connections to resources that ensure the long-term success of their GROW projects. Um, because the great demand and interest in food security projects, the GROW team strives to expand the capacity of the program beyond 2020 when um, our grant is up. So yeah, and we've also been doing these webinars. So um, I'm glad you all could be here today. Thanks, Sinead. And I will go ahead and introduce our guest speakers today. So we have uh, Rosanna McGinnis from uh, the Sildovia Can Grow Project. And she's gonna be talking about what she's done um, in reaching out to different groups in her community to make sure that people are fed. And we have Eyes Palmer uh, from the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition. And they're gonna be talking about what's going on in their region. And then um, Garen Tarr, yay, thanks Garen. I know you're super busy, um, our representative in the Alaska State Legislature, my representative actually. And um, she's also one of the chairs of the new Alaska Grown Caucus. And she'll be telling us what, what our leaders in Juneau are doing on this issue. So um, I know Rosanna has sketchy internet access in Sildovia, so she asked if she could, you know, go first and, and do some talking before they cut her off there. So um, Rosanna, go ahead. Why don't you tell us um, a little bit about your program? Thank you, Emily. And I do just want to extend a huge um, uh, load of gratitude to Rural Cap and to this GROW program uh, for the impact that you're helping us make here in Soldovia. So thanks everybody on the team and for your hard work. Um, so I'm coming to you, I'm Rosanna, and I'm coming to you from Soldovia. Uh, I own Rosanna's Garden, which is the first um, market garden in Soldovia. And um, I uh, was instrumental in starting uh, the Soldovia Farmer's Market, which was is our first ever farmer's market. Um, so for a handful of years, uh, especially since COVID hit, I've been super interested in in uh, what we need to do here to provide better food security for Soldovia and really work on a culture uh, shift or culture change with the community in uh, realizing that we can uh, grow and provide and that um, thinking about this is not only important, it's just necessary. Um, so a little bit about Soldovia, it's uh, at almost at the very tip of the Kenai Peninsula and it's off the road system. And so to get here, uh, you have to either fly in a small, our, our runway isn't large enough for large planes. So you've got to fly here in a Cessna size airplane, six seater, something like that. 
Um, or you can come on a, a small boat via water taxi, your own skiff, or on the state ferry. And why I mention those things is because that totally impacts our uh, transportation network, which in, then in turn um, impacts uh, the food and the health of the food and the health of the supplies that we get, because oftentimes, especially in the winter, um, and even in the summer during COVID, when COVID first started, we had uh, some really big scary times when the suppliers were really restricted on what they were gonna run. Um, so uh, um, he, here we are and we're in this little community and winter hits and um, we know that we can only get things here via boat or plane. The Homer Harbor freezes, it's frozen for three weeks at a time, which means no boats can come back and forth. Now we're reliant on airplanes and what happens in the winter in Alaska, snowstorms, fog, uh, sleet, rain, hail, wind, the planes can't fly. And so now what happens to the food uh, that we're bringing in, um, it's sitting in trucks in Homer, it's going bad. It might be held in the refrigerator or freezer at our air carrier and it might be there for several days. And so this is becoming more and more of an issue here. And especially now that prices are going up, up, up on everything. And the, the network to get things here, it just isn't, it, it honestly, it's just not reliable because we have so many factors. So um, we started uh, with that in mind, we, uh, and because there are a lot of passionate growers here, um, we started um, the idea that we would uh, work on changing the culture here and feeding the people. Um, and so right now we are certainly still a work in progress. Um, but I did wanna just talk to you about some of the things that we have done and that we're trying to do in, in case those ideas help you. Um, so one of the very helpful things uh, for our efforts is that uh, our city plan includes verbiage in it about food security and about the economy, improving the economy through providing for the people. And so um, I, while it isn't always an easy thing to do, that is something that you could consider, which is working with your local city or government to see if they don't have a, a plan plan in place, a 10-year, five-year plan, um, and um, ask them, can I look at it? Does it have any um, verbiage in it around that? And uh, if not, maybe open up some dialogue about the importance of that and about including that, because that will help drive uh, that governing organization um, towards our, our all of our mutual goal of food security and feeding our people and, and sustainability. So uh, we had that to our advantage. We're still working, attempting to work with our city to try to make things happen here, but that is uh, one thing I thought that would be helpful. The other thing is uh, passion. And I think in our group of, of folks that we have here, there's no shortage of passion about things, um, especially growing and providing food and being healthy. Um, you know, and sometimes it takes that personal impact, you know, for us when we sit around in the dark days of winter and we have no fresh food on the shelves, nothing for two weeks at a time that's a huge personal impact. Um, but on top of it, a financial impact as well is how much does it cost us to not be able to provide for ourselves? And then finally, the health. I mean, when we're getting this food in, it might have taken two to three weeks to travel here. And um, the nutrient density, the nutrient value of it is so low compared to food that if we could put it up uh, um, catch it, hunt it, or grow it compared to what the nutrient value of that would be. So um, you got to find your passionate players that believe in those, those elements. And, um, and then another helpful thing is that we have a really good uh, diversity on our team of folks that are working and, and just sort of strive to um, 
use everybody's talents, use everybody's talents and strengths. One of our team members um, is super organized. And so she's the one that'll sit down and she'll say, okay, we need to break out the roles. We need somebody to, to um, be a PR person and we need another person to do the social media and we need another person to run the market. And we need, another, so she's our organizer. We have uh, somebody who is, um, also really super passionate about recycling, um, upcycling, sustainability, uh, keeping uh, things out of the landfill, which helps our effort for food security as well, because um, you know we can uh, work together to create, we're not there yet, but we're, we have a good vision of working together to create a community uh, composting program. So we can not only keep things out of the landfill, but use those things to grow more food. Um, and then another player on our team is uh, she's very passionate about food storage. She's a great at fermenting foods and putting food up. So we're sort of, uh, the, that's the advice there is just build, building a team that you recognize the strengths and, and that little bit of diversity is really um, nice for us to have, but it also makes it kind of fun because everybody has their own little uh, niche niche and we do we do have some missing holes here i will definitely say that that we're working for um and then keep in mind that you may need to drive a, a culture change or a thought process change here in soldovia um you know for um many many years uh well the the thought process was well we're on the dark side and we um we fish and the farmers, well, those are the people over in Homer where the sun is shining. Um, it's just uh, based on the, the way that uh, they're, they're facing south and, and we don't. And so um, there's this culture that now we leave the farming and the homesteading, potato growing and all of that to the, to the folks and farmers and we're fishermen, that's what we've been. Um, but the thing is, uh, we're dealing with a warmer climate to warmer uh, temperatures than we've ever had. And we are also in a time where we have access to better technology to grow things for a longer periods of time. And so what we're really wanting to do and working on is teaching the people of Seldovia, look at this. I've got, it's April, it's the end of March, and I've got food growing. I've got things planted in my high tunnel. And um, look, we can, we can hold our food over. We can keep growing things all the way to the end of October or the middle of October. And um, we can do it. We can do more than fish. We, we can grow more food than you ever thought possible, which you know was a thing. There was always gardens here, but there were never farmers here really. So we're working hard to get people to understand the, that, that just shipped out of that box of, well, we don't we can't and we don't. Well, times are different. It's warmer. We have better um, tools that we can use to grow. So yes, we can and we will and we're going to. Um, so uh, the other thing is reaching out and I've been um, super fortunate to be part of a 10 year project, the Food um, Policy Council project which is working hard to gather um, all kinds of data and make an impact throughout the state on food security. And so um, I think that what we have here in Alaska is a lot of people that are, are thinking about this, a lot of people that are doing different things. And I think that they're very willing to share as am I. And so um, I just urge everybody, you know, you don't have to know it all. You don't have to have all the pieces in place. You don't have to have all the knowledge, um, you know, just don't, but don't be afraid to reach out and say, hey, how did you do this? Or how did you do that? Um, so uh, a little, uh, to end up a little recap about what our plan is, is we've got a group of people that are currently trying to build um, the market and also an organization, which would be somewhat of a, a co-op type of uh, system where our growers could join the co-op and that it, they would be able to sell their food. 
um, and that it would also include educational projects like and inviting the community up to our community center in the fall for putting up the food for um, making um, ferments and, and that's already going on to an extent but it would uh, really embrace a large part of what we think of as food security in all the areas and supporting it. Um, so if anybody, I would also ask that if any of you has any um, thoughtful stuff to share with the Seldovia team, I love learning. So any, um, anything you can share with me, I would uh, do an open call to say thanks, I'll take it and I would be happy to learn from you. Um, but it's exciting to be working with you all and um, I love growing, I love feeding the people, it matters, it matters to me to grow food that people in this community can buy that, that, that didn't come from a field in the lower 48 that came from my field and that I know is full of nutrients and that I know is healthy, that I know is good and that is reasonably priced uh, for what they're getting. So um, that's what drives me. And um, I think that's, I'm gonna wrap that up and say thank you for giving me the time today and good luck to everybody. Thanks, Rosanna. It's always uh, inspiring to hear you talk. I, you do have one question. Uh, Jeanette actually asked, would you be willing to put your contact info in the chat? Um, so if you could do that. And what other questions do you have for Rosanna? You can just unmute yourself and ask. Thank you, Rosanna. I, I love the way you talk and you're so passionate, finding passionate people. This is Jeanette and Soldatna. And even though we're in the same borough, um, things are so different. Your local is much different than my local. And I just wondered if you could address how you are um, fertilizing your field. Do you have access to fish fertilizer and things like that in Soldovia? Thank you. Oh boy, this is such a cool question. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, so, you know, in my dream world, we would here in Soldovia, and I do hope to set my farm up to be a teaching farm for off uh, road villages, because it's a huge deal to haul in fertilizer, to haul in amendments, to haul in topsoil. I mean, even like uh, I rely on chicken manure. I have I keep chickens, and even that, you know, if I want to, if I run into a bind and I have to to uh, send chicken food over, I literally pay twice the price of what you pay because I'm paying for freight. So yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty passionate about that. We're not there yet, but I am going to tell you that what I do here is a method somewhat like that, and I would love, love, love to put more work and effort into this. But in Soldovia, I build my beds using something called an, uh, a lasagna method, and um, it is known as um, layering or the self composting beds there's other names for it um, but yes basically that is what I do um, I uh, okay everybody gets Amazon um there's not a village in this state that does not receive cardboard boxes through the mail okay so I uh, I layer my I just build layers and that's how I grow my my beds start so I start with a layer of cardboard and then um, it comes fish carcasses and those are not hard to come by at all we're a fishing village as I mentioned before and also what happens is uh, many many people get to the spring and the new season of fishing is coming and they want to get rid of their freezer burnt fish give it to me please I I've got people that bring me buckets of of fish um, and uh, so that's a layer in my beds and then I usually do a, a layer of a straw and then chicken manure or animal manure and then a fresh green grass or compost from your com you know even household compost that's not even broken down all the way you can put in there and that leaves it so that I just have a very small layer at the top, um, you know, even an inch or two of topsoil, which we can gather from underneath the alder trees if we want the really good stuff. 
Um, but you don't even need the really good stuff because what you've got going on under there is this self composting action. I'll also put leaves from under the forest. They've got, they're full of mycelium and that helps break everything down. And so um, my plants happily grow in these beds which uh, compost themselves throughout the season. This is something I would love to share with more people, um, but I'd also love to do the work of figuring out uh, how communities um, can use the resources that they have on hand because by and by and large, we all probably do have things in our communities that that can be used for this method that would make plants grow great. So I, I loved your question because I, I love talking about and sharing about that method. So thank you for asking. Well, the, my name is Irene Brooks. I'm a uh, food bank uh, coordinator, for lack of a better word, with uh, Copper River Native Association out here in Tessalina. And um, I was wondering, were, did you target specific organizations or groups of people when you were putting together your um, your focus group, or did you just say anybody who's interested come and join us? Well, we, we did a little bit of both and um, the passion part really mattered because in the beginning we had a meeting and we had um, a lot of people showing up, but you know, through time that trickles away to where the people that are left are the ones that really feel passionate about that. So it, it did have to do in part um, with who were the players um, and how uh, passionate were they about this project. Um, but we did um, target, for example, um, one of the people on our project, she is the manager of our community center. And so she's also uh, responsible for working with their board and they put on their goals or action items for their plan for the year of food security and putting food up. So, you know, it wasn't just the city plan that had it, but it, it through her passion, it got added on to the community center plan plan too. And so I feel like, um, you know, our, our, I'm really lucky because in my community, I'm actually also the postmaster and it makes it so uh, that I know everybody and um, probably Irene in your community, you do too. And then you have a, a sense of not only, okay, what is their passion level, but uh, what organizations do they represent? And maybe those are the people that you go to to say, hey, could the tribe or could the city or could um, the association um, help us? And, and they're sort of your, your in the door people to get those organizations to help you. And it may even be that there's people that don't live in your area that might be able to influence. Um, um, for example, the Food Policy Council is set up by regions and there may be people in your region that could be real champions for uh, your work, um, um, but they might not necessarily live in your community or near you. I, I hope that helps you. Thank you. All right, let's uh, let's zoom north to eyes here, and they are going to tell us about what's going on in Fairbanks. Oh wait, sorry, I need to start my camera. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, can you guys see me? Okay. Yeah. So I'm Eyes. I work and live on the lands of the Lower Tenanadene people. My background is in elder informed ethnobotanical research. I'm the program assistant at the University of Alaska Ethnobot um, Ethnobotany Program. Um, fundraising, I've done fundraising in the past for um, just personally on a, on a mutual aid level and um, now moving into grant writing for Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition food security um, and nonprofit work and working at the um, UAF food pantry through the Office of Sustainability. I am a psychology student um, and I am studying emergency management and sustainable energy and ethnobotany, of course. Um, some specifics that I want to present about food security before we go into like what FCAC and EBA are doing are just um, 
The overall discussion being that it varies, there's multiple layers to being food secure, um, to be considered such as land access, are harvest safe lands um, accessible and unpoisoned storage? Can you store and can you store your harvested food? And do you have enough space and adequate living living conditions to store food? Emergency access: um, If you're able to hunt for wild foods and harvest wild foods, can you do so in an emergency? Um, and then agricultural security: Do you have access to to grow food on? And then we have personal versus communal security. And I want to highlight the difference between personal um, and communal security because they intersect and impact each other. One is less sustainable because you have to consider how long am I gonna be here? Resources run out and when they do, we have to lean on our community. So the point is communal resilience so that we as individuals can also become secure for a longer time. And in my ethnobotanical study and work, we really learn as students and professionals that climate justice cannot happen without the equitable empowerment and involvement of black and or brown indigenous people. Um, and we may also make it very clear that they are plant experts. Um, food security from an ethnobotanical approach considers the land of the people that occupy the area who have a deep understanding of the flora. Um, ethnobotanists hold these three things imperative, ethical harvesting, education, so including plant identification um, and valuable plants to said region, so plants that should not be harvested by non-Indigenous people or um, commodified, and then the educational portion that comes from elders and speaking to people who have been working with that plant matter for a long time, and then in an agricultural perspective comes in soil and water testing, um, and then so when you are moving into forming a food security task force, you have to assess what is already happening in your area. So this means talking to people and asking questions, finding out where your local food banks are and your local food pantries, and then also collaborating and talking to people that run gardens and farming programs. And then empowering the people who are already in the lands is very important. Um, women and children interact with plant matter more in a more diverse range of plant matter um, because of the difference in domestic household labor and jobs um, throughout throughout the world really. Um, so this includes wild foods and agricultural food. So when you move into starting your own food security project, um, it's more accessible. Then you know you really just have to pick something and streamline it. Um, and that of course should include women and children. So seeking your community. And um, one thing that I like to do is investing in my community through barter and trade. So like say I pickle something, I usually have a friend that has some other wild plant or something that they harvest that we um, can exchange. So taking the money aspect out of it is really helpful. Yes, honey. Sorry, I have a toddler. Okay. Um, yes, give me one second. Yes. I'm gonna wrap up in two seconds, I'm almost done. Let me see. And then um, of course, co-ops. So supporting local farmers and requiring into receiving some sort of resource if you can. Like um, some people will kind of like Spotify and um, doing that monthly subscription thing where you can go get milk. Um, if you can do subscriptions for, <laughs> Charlie does have something to say about food security. If you can do subscriptions for services, you can totally um, set those up with gardeners and farmers. And people are more um, willing to exchange in goods than you might realize. You really just have to ask people. And that is one of the unique things about Alaska is a lot of us are people that have some sort of resource. We have usually something going on where we're hunting. Um, we're very crafty. So something that you can um, lean into your community for. And then starting small. Um, is my biggest recommendation because a lot of people think that when they move into this work that they have to do everything. You do not have to open a food bank. You could grow mint. Um, everything that you do really matters and what, doing one thing very well can make a huge difference in your community, especially for someone that doesn't have that resource or that education. Um, so I would say collaborate, ask questions, and seek community because we have to do this together and everyone has something another person needs. Thank you guys. Um, I'll be right back. My child needs their potty. Thank you, Eyes. Um, that is, you know, uh, 
I got a lot of good ideas, even just as you were talking about starting small and some of the things that I want to do this summer in, you know, taking my little space and, you know, branching out into community. So I don't think they're available for questions, but um, I bet they'll be back. So you can, if you have questions for eyes, put them in the chat and hopefully we can get to them. And in the meantime, we'll we'll go on to you, Garen. Thanks for joining us uh, so much. We appreciate you taking your time. Tell us what's going on in Juno with food security. Okay, can you hear me okay? Okay, very good. Well, I'm very pleased to be able to join you today. One of my most favorite topics to ever discuss. And I've appreciated the comments from um, Rosanna and then from Eyes um, and hearing more about your story. Just to share a little bit about me, my background is not that typical of a legislator, so um, I appreciate getting to share it, but I'm actually a botanist by training, and when I went to school, what got me um, really into um, food and food issues and food security and food justice was just the way food can be such a connector. Um, you know, the way I see it, um, a connector to other people because we share food together. It's a connector to your health, right? Because if you're caring about your health and thinking about the food that you eat has a big impact on that, a connection to caring for our environment, of course, and with climate change, um, much more important than ever that we be talking and thinking about caring for our environment and how food systems are impacting our, our environment and positively and negatively. And also just caring about labor and um, the way people are treated, um, the people who grow our food, making sure that they have fair and living wages um, and safe um, chemical free workplaces. So that was really what got me interested in food. And I was lucky um, where I went to college to be in a strong farming community. So I was able to manage community gardens I was one of the people who helped found a food co-op there, um, did a lot of teaching of organic gardening and um, biointensive gardening. That's the kind of gardening that I do. If you're not familiar, I'm just going to hit something in the chat so you can learn more about it. It's a combination of permaculture design and the French intensive and biodynamic methods. And it's um, very consistent with trying to live um, in in nature's image is what we, we like to say. Um, when I moved to Alaska, I was one of the founding board members of the Alaska Organic Association. And that um, went away when the federal government took over organic certification and then was a founding board member of the Anchorage Farmers Market. Um, that's the one at the church on 15th. And that was really important for us in terms of food security because it was the first farmer's market where all the products were grown in Alaska. Um, that was unusual at the time going on close to 20 years ago, um, but that was really important for farmers to um, have that access, that direct access to consumers. And then um, have been very lucky to continue working with organizations, um, nonprofits and others to continue teaching organic gardening and edible and medicinal plants. Um, and getting to share that knowledge and connection with people. So um, that, that background is what makes it so fun for me here in the legislature to get to work on food security issues. And just as I um, came to work on food issues and it was the big connector for so many things, working on food issues here in the legislature is turning out to be a way to connect people and get them to work together. So the, um, so the work that we're doing this year um, is, um, we had to change the name actually, it's now the Alaska Food and Farm Caucus, but very excited that we have a bicameral, bipartisan group of, of legislators that have come together to work on improving food security and really um, thinking about that in very broad terms because not just food security, but also building our agricultural industry and um, developing that sector. And so we're very excited about that. And so, you know, we're thinking of um, products like peonies or hemp as potential um, items for, you know, developing those markets and then also um, possibly export products. So it's, it's that. We're also thinking about sustainable fisheries as part of this um, in terms of food security. So um, wanting to, to be kind of as comprehensive as possible in our approach. But what we hope to accomplish is 
by being more collaborative and working together through the process, being more efficient and effective with our time. Our sessions um, often have not been finishing on time, but um, have been really um, stuck ar around some of these big issues that have been unresolved. And it's prevented some of the other work from getting done. And so what we hope to accomplish by having this group work together is to be better coordinated on what our priorities are and um, be able to you know, kind of educate each other so that, for example, if a bill is from the House, um, when it goes over to the Senate, you'll have a bunch of senators who are already you know, familiar with the legislation, helped with the drafting of it, can speak to their colleagues and hopefully help it get through the process. Um, some folks um, may have um, been involved in the effort or know about our effort on the herd share programs. Um, for example, we had a bill passed last year to expand opportunities through herd share programs and also allow for va value added options like cheese and ice cream and butter um, for those to become available through herd share programs. Um, that bill almost made it across the finish line a couple of times and then we ran out of time. Um, and so that's just one example of the things that we hope we could prevent from happening by collaborating a little bit more, you know, be able to get the bill through more in one year or two years. Um, and what's been really fun about that is, you know, already we've seen lots of farmers taking advantage of that new opportunity and um, seeing how that is ex allowing them to expand their customer base and you know build build and, and expand. So just what we hope to accomplish in terms of um, providing that opportunity and then um, seeing that growth and we're seeing that. So we know, you know, we know that's there. We know we're not the ones that will do everything, but we can make some strategic investments. And so this year we're hoping to put some dollars towards some food security grants. And we've been working together to develop the language around what those grants might look like. And we really want to make sure that there would be some monies available for existing farmers who might want to do something, say, for season extension. Or, you know, we have um, folks that are interested in growing the size of their herd for dairy, for meat, um, getting more chickens for eggs, that kind of thing. So, you know, if you're an existing farmer, we want to have an opportunity that's available to you. But then um, in some of these new areas of the state, like the Ninana Tolchacket area, where there's some interest in opening up those new agricultural lands, then we want to have some dollars that could go for things like land clearing and irrigation systems and early stage development. So trying to find a balance between um, both of those and then also trying to fund a program that would be for meat processing. Um, if you've been watching what's been happening across the country, um, in fact, during the pandemic, there was that moment where um, basically uh, the head of Tyson Foods and some of the others were sa saying, you know, our food system is broken um, because it's so consolidated that the disruption, you know, in one of those choke points meant that, you know, people across the country were not going to have access to those products. So we can do a lot more in-state. And um, interestingly enough, on the meat side of things, we used to have a state inspection program. And so I, I just want to mention that because, you know, kind of understanding where we are often is important to reflect on where we came from. And in 1999, we um, cut that um, state inspection program because of budget cuts. There was, you know, pressure on the budget to make some budget cuts at that time. Well, here we've got, you know, now this more than 20 years to reflect on that. Um, we know that was not a good decision. It didn't um, contribute to improving food security in Alaska. And in fact, you know, it is it has pushed us um, so much closer to the edge in terms of having limited capacity across the state. So. Um, doing in-state meat processing could be a huge opportunity. We know we have um, producers out there that are interested. We know the consumers are interested. And so just trying to kind of connect the dots and make that um, available more regionally. We're looking long-term at transportation infrastructure. Um, folks might know if you're familiar with the Delta area, one of the things that makes that area work um, agriculture-wise is that they have the railroad. And so, um, for example, for fertilizer and for feed, they can bring that in by rail, which is far, far less expensive. They have a co-op there. So um, there's discussion about the, the northern piece of the rail and then also the Point Mac piece of the rail. You know, those are more long-term projects. 
Um, but you can't have a, you know, if you don't have a vision and a plan for your future, it's hard to get there. So that's the kind of vision we need is, is, you know, what do we want this to look like in 10 years, 15 years, you know, 30, 50, um, and start thinking about those kind of um, infrastructure investments that can happen. So, you know, right now we hope to put some dollars um, in the into the budget that can be invested in strategic ways that that can be available um, to possibly any of you on this um, Zoom today, and and then you know those would be the kind of near term projects where we could see some increases, while also um, working together and identifying you know these longer term, um, particularly infrastructure needs. So we start connecting some pieces. Right now, for example, at um, Point McKenzie, I think the state has spent about $200 million on the rail line that basically goes to nowhere right now. So it really doesn't make a lot of sense to spend a couple hundred million dollars and then not actually finish the project so that it can be used for the intended purpose. Um, unfortunately, we're really good at doing that, spending a lot of money on things that we sort of half finish or don't finish at all. So hopefully we'll put an end to that, but it's a very exciting time. Um, I didn't mention that um, half the legislature are members of this Alaska Food and Farm Caucus. So it's the most bipartisan, um, bicameral kind of effort we have happening right now and um, strong participation, a lot of excitement. And so hopefully we'll have some good news for all of you at the end of session. Thank you. Awesome, Garen, thank you so much. Uh, what questions are there for her, please? Or for Eyes, if you didn't get a chance to ask. Or for Rosanna, for that matter. <laughs> May I ask a question of uh, Reptar? Um, hi, my name is Harney Payton, I live in Seldovia, and I was just wondering if this is, um, so your process here, is including funding for people who might be looking for land acquisi acquisition with the intent of um, food production, like, you know, here in Seldovia, you know, Roseanne has taken up a big um, undertaking with trying to establish more, uh, a more sustainable food source in our community um, as far as uh, <clears throat> greens go. And there's a lot of us here who are working on those steps. Um, on the down in Kodiak, they have, um, you know, they have bovine and stuff. And a lot of us here in, the, in our community have birds. But what we don't have is any, we don't have anybody who's actively um, producing or working towards, um, you know, like hoofs, uh, you know, pigs, goats, uh, cows, um, bigger flocks of chickens to a uh, tip to produce um, meat instead of just eggs. Um, so I was just wondering, um, that's a, a big part of like the farming ecosystem, right? Um, it's a, a big part of like soil mending is to have manure. Um, I don't think that our area needs big production, um, you know, like three, three to nine acres would probably be, you know, probably more like nine acres would be sufficient to provide, you know, our community and even um, this, the, the two villages near us, if they were interested in a program like that. Um, is that the type of thing that you guys are working towards or did I just start dreaming based off what I was hearing? No, that is the type of thing that we're working towards. And I put a link to a bill in the chat House Bill 354, and if you look at the language, this is what we're working on right now and hoping we're gonna be able to get done. Um, if you go down to the bottom of page three, it says temporary grant program for meat processing, and then towards the bottom of page four, temporary grant program for farm development and improvement. And these are the dollars we're trying to do, um, you know, invest in these ways. So basically, you know, the several million dollars would get put into this program this year, but it would be considered a multi-year program. And it's not written in a very prescriptive way because we hope the Division of Agriculture could have some latitude in developing the criteria for how you would qualify to participate. Um, but the idea is, um, you'll see in that, it says up to 15,000 for three years. And I think what we want to do is change that to be up to, um, it'll be $150,000 total 
over potentially a five year or seven year period. And so please take a look at that language and think if, you know, it would you qualify the way that that is drafted right now? And if not, you know, please give us some feedback because the idea is that we want to accommodate both, you know, new farm development and existing farmers. You know, the ideas, um, Harmony, that you shared, that's what we hope to have incorporated in this program. Um, we're calling, you know, in this original draft, it's called grant, uh, grant but we're going to change that to be credit because really the idea is um, what will happen is, you know, you would su submit a plan and be approved for a certain amount of expenses. And then as you spend that money on a quarterly basis, you would be able to submit for some reimbursements. And so what we would be trying to accomplish is removing the barrier sort of, you know, the, one, the financial barrier, but then also the time barrier of having to make significant upfront capital investment and then, you know, waiting through the whole growing season or, you know, multiple growing seasons till you can recoup a significant enough portion for the math to work. So, you know, hopefully this accelerated reimbursement schedule could make it so that, you know, people would still have to be able to make some investments, but, um, but it would happen in a, you know, sort of real time fashion um, so that, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the typical delay um, of waiting. But um, we found ourselves in discussing this sort of, you know, this, this little bit of tension between um, you want to, you know, make sure that the dollars get used effectively and invested, you know, in things that are going to be successful. But at the same time, don't want to, um, you know, make it so challenging to participate that people would be discouraged. So kind of trying to um, strike the balance. So please do um, look at that and see, you know, what you think of that language and I would love to ha have any feedback. We've been sharing that now for the last um, month or so, you know, in these kind of conversations and have made significant, um, you know, changes as a re result. So for example, you know, instead of just three years, the five years or seven years, instead of just the 15,000, um, per year, <clears throat> changing it to be up to $150,000 total, you know, so being more realistic about, um, you know, the, uh, the dollar amount um, and, and what, what someone can do with that, that kind of investment. Um, a couple other things are more technical, but just making it a fund so that the money is there over a multi-year period. Um, but those are kind of the big ones in terms of the timing and the dollar amount. And then looking at the language to make sure it's um, kind of inclusive of, of all the needs that people might want it for. So Margaret, is your question um, related to that bill? So Margaret was asking, will there be mentors to help people develop high density vegetable growing that is region specific? So is there anything in the bill that's related to teaching? Is that... Well, the way we have it envisioned now is that a portion of it of, of the dollars that go towards this program can be used to administer the program. And so we hope that that would mean, you know, there would be someone either hired in a staff capacity or a, contract, a, a contractor that could provide that kind of support because it does say it needs to have a business plan, but it doesn't say, you know, what that business plan needs to include. So again, the idea is, you know, around here, um, people want to have some level of confidence that if you're going to spend, you know, some millions of dollars on something that it's, you know, going to go for the intended purpose and not, um, you know, not be invested in, I guess, you know, operations that don't, don't seem to have a lot of potential. So, you know, we just want to have a little bit of checks and balances in there. Um, but then also um, someone who can provide support. Yes. Great. Did, did that answer your question, Margaret? Yes, that's what I, because that's one of the hardest things sometimes when you're trying to do something is to get the right information at the right time so that you're not spinning your wheels and planting the wrong stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, you know, unfortunately, we used to do more um, in the way of support, but the Division of Agriculture has been trimmed back quite a bit over the last several years. And so uh, you know, more people are having to do, you know, one person's doing more things and then there's less of that um, 
support role. So I think that is really important part of, of doing something like this. Other questions? Um, how do you take feedback on the bill? Is that via email? Email is fine, yeah. And I'll just put it um, here in the chat. If Rosanna is on the line, um, I would like to ask in um, Slodovia, what is your ground and air temperature when you can start doing your lasagna beds? Um, so the thing is with the lasagna beds is you're going above. You don't even have to do anything to the ground that you're building on top of. And um, so what you can generate quite a bit of heat with this because they self compost and for example if you're using the chicken manure and the fish they're going to start to break down and generate some heat and so uh, for like last year I built my first lasagna bed I think it was either the middle or the end of March and that was a pretty cold year I'm I'm still working on and you know figuring things out because the other thing is yeah the air temperature does matter but these are growing um, in in the light and these are growing inside of a tunnel with blankets on them as well so uh, we got the reme on top of them as well and giving them a love from below and love from above. And uh, I, I feel like uh, I don't have it with me, but I feel like I was measuring in my lasagna bed that I made towards the end of March. My, the temperature of it was you know, in, the, in the 60s and everything else was still down at 40. Um, so I think, um, you know, we're pretty temperate here in Soldovia, but we definitely have in March and in April, a lot of freezing days and, and still things are going and growing. Um, so I hope that helps. Yeah, so this is something you're doing inside a tunnel, not in the open, unexposed environment. That's right. And that's one of those pieces of technology or advancements that I hope we can get a lot more of uh, in rural places, especially in Alaska, because it's a game changer. Um, we're, we're creating a little microclimate. We're not ever, you know, they're not heated uh, unless people pay to put those systems in. And so we're not ever going to get around super deep freeze, but we certainly can get into those and grow in them and get things started in them a lot sooner than we ever used to be able to. Yeah, I'm calling from Katabu and, you know, we've got tons of snow still and but we've got 15 hours of daylight. And I know my greenhouse got up to 38 the other day, but I didn't want to risk it. That's why I thought I'd better ask the real temperature before I start doing anything experimental out there. Thanks. Yeah, Annabelle, do you have access to get seaweed out in Katabu? You know, I imagine we would. I've never looked, but after all these garden classes online everyone's talking about seaweed i'm like yeah. okay we can truck and go grab seaweed and see what happens i'll let you guys know yeah that a great place to harvest you know just like your um compost compostable material or stuff for your lasagna bed is the high tide line um that's a great you know pick out the trash if there's any but yeah there's just tons of great stuff in there and no yeah you don't need to rinse the seaweed it's you know by the time it's up there on the beach it's fine Thanks. There's That's lots helpful. of, yeah, and I, I would say our partners in, in um, let's see, in Wrangell and also in Kodiak have done a lot with seaweed, and um, I'll put my email in the chat. If you email me, I can send you those videos. It's just ebecker at ruralcap.org. So uh, anyway, we're a little bit off track. I'll go ahead. Um, thank you so much to our speakers and everyone who joined and asked questions. It's, this is such a really inspiring topic and there's so much happening in Alaska. I think that's really exciting now. So thanks very much for coming and I'm gonna stop the recording here. <laughs>